guys, welcome back. Here we are, back on Wind Chaser. Uh, finished up um, fields one and two. Uh, hopped in um, T600. We did three already, and now we're going about to uh, start uh, digging into field 18, which is beans. Um, so we're just kind of working our way down. About fifty percent in my uh, trailer here. Uh, I've been working on my disc a little bit. I uh, sold my Tiger Mates to kind of give me that um, extra motivation to model. And um, um, so far, so good. I don't actually know how many discs are on um, uh, 50 foot, uh, 26, 23. I think I have 64 or. Um, 64 throughout the whole width of the implement, uh, 32 on one side. Um, so I actually don't know how many discs are on there. So if anyone knows how many discs are on uh, one side of a um, 54, 26, 23, that'd be great if you could like go ahead and comment. But right now it kind of looked like I I counted, you know, pictures best I could. Um, and I came up with what seemed to be 32 on one side, so it could be more, could be less. I'm not really sure, but it looks it looks proportionally decent, so um, it's got to be close. So I just went with that. So there's 64 discs, and then there's like on the back set, there's like two extra little ones, so about 66 in the back. So you can kind of see where we were as we were spraying in the field. The uh, tracks see a little bit better. Um, so just try to like stay in my headlands when I'm turning. And, uh, uh, it's it's not too terrible, but uh, it's definitely not ideal. Uh, we have probably close to two and a half or three hours of spraying in, so. Um, I think I'm going to actually go ahead and um, make a New Holland front boom just because all of my equipment right now is New Holland except for our sprayer so if we can like get the New Holland sprayer plus I can make it 130 or 135 foot depending on what model I make. Um, so that'd be uh, pretty cool to have. Plus, um, just kind of like kind of thinking how I would we really need I don't actually think we need MPK on this. Why did I have it Seems to be pretty decent, actually. I'd put down PK, but that would probably shoot it up too much. So we're actually probably pretty good with this field. Six three seventy one. Could use a little bit. I wonder why I made a note to do NPK in this field. Anyways, these are um, large hog, old old uh, hog buildings. Need to um, go ahead and actually eventually make new hog barns. So there's basically nothing in it. 
But I really never really got into hog farming, so it's kind of like, yeah, so I don't understand why I made that. I think 18 is fine. Anyways, going back to New Holland, if I were to make the front boom, I could, uh, you know, uh, maybe make an attachable, um, um, uh, what do they call that, where you uh, side dressing the, so you can side dress 48 inch corn and stuff like that. Alright, now we're going to go on to our corn over here. So this... Okay, 17, 17 is where we need to go. We need to go to 17. And I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to unzip my uh, New Holland Combine Pack and... Um, And add a 990 with ATI tracks and a bin extension, so it can run. We could run two 10 or uh, 990s on our farm. One with a set of duals and other ATI. Yeah, I mean, this field 18 is looking pretty good. I mean, the only thing is it can maybe use a little shot of lime. But overall, foliage seems to look pretty good. One sixty three. We're over here on the south part of the map. I was thinking of maybe next season we could pick up uh, like eight, nine, sixteen over there. Um, put a lot of work into these fields over here, but um, it gets kind of old after a while to. Uh, Keep farming the same, you know, same scenery. So over here we put down lime. So, so it's the same thing. So we need to go over to 17. Um, we'll get our truck again, I guess. Move it over there. Check out 44 while we're at it, I guess. Looks like we're way good on 44.
Okay, what do we have in the silos? We have canola. Canola prices are going up. So it's currently Monday in our save game. And so what we're going to do is go trample some corn. Spray is a little bit dirty now. Corn's a little bit too tall for this. We would have had that front boom, we'd be able to spray this stuff, no problem. Before I start spraying, um, we should really just put down PK. There we go. So we're just down here crushing some corn. Put down some PK. I think this would look really cool with a high front high, uh, front end high boom. Spray this in the whole top. So, ideally, I'd like to have my PK up around four, um, four, you know, four or five during harvest. I think I'd have to, I'd have to check back on ideal uh, nutrient. Values. I mean, when you're gone for two months, forget quite a bit of stuff. This is some uh, corn texture I just found on Google. Did a little bit of cropping and stuff like that to get some nice green corn.
Next field we should really pick up is 29. Glad we don't have the spray 18. I was expecting the spray 18, but this seems to be in pretty good shape still. So. This field, however, not so much. I really don't know how the PK gets so low. I don't understand the discrepancy. Imagine if we keep tilling in residue from corn or something, and eventually you're going to get more nitrogen than the PK at 30. I wish the soil mod was a little bit more dynamic, like uh, certain crops would take in a certain amount of nutrients and a crop might uh, put in some nutrients like nitrogen fixation or uh, maybe a crop might do better in a certain pH versus another crop like corn maybe a little bit acidic and alfalfa maybe a little bit more neutral, stuff like that. Corn would use more nutrients than, say, like a soybean plant. I, don't know. I think it's very doable, but I'm not sure if Decker is interested in doing that anymore. So we would just be sawn off. Well, I mean, maybe you could get away with doing this. You're below the years, so. I would say this is about two weeks, three weeks worth of growth that we're spraying. We're about two or three weeks late from when we really should be. One growth stage behind. Still looks cool driving through there. It's gonna be fun to pick this. Two combines, got a bigger grain cart. Should be a pretty uh, slick operation over here. When you think about some of these plants, corn is actually a pretty interesting plant. I mean, it's so different um, compared to everything else, or like a soybean plant, or like a grain. Or oil. It's just so, so unique. You got this big old stalk, and you got ears of corn, and you got kernels inside the ear. The sheer amount. Of Organic material that goes into a stock. It's pretty impressive. And then you look at the uh, machines that harvest this, and they're just breaking through, like, say, like a 12 or 16 row corn header going at you know, five, five and a half miles an hour. The amount of material <laughs> that combine is bringing in. It's incredible. That's why engineering is so cool. Stuff 
do this. You can dream it. You can build it. You can design it. I'm not sure how much of a problem uh, wind erosion is. I noticed like when I was back home, uh, I was always curious why some farmers leave like strips of corn in the field. Um, I think some of them do it for like the deer and wildlife because you know they obviously hunt too. So that was like my main thought is oh they're just leaving corn in the field for deer that they can hunt. Um, but then you start seeing it next to the roads or a little bit, you know, off the roads. And so I think what it is, is it's like a snow fence maybe. Um, and another thing I noticed when I was back home is usually you see a lot of tillage being done. Um, you don't see that much, like, standing stocks, corn stocks, but back home there's probably like stocks foot and a half tall like they chop it so high and then they just leave that in the for like I guess the winter to take take care of but uh, it's almost like no one around where my parents live did any sort of tillage whatsoever in the fall um, which is usually they do but I didn't see any signs of tillage at all. So maybe they're trying to, uh, I don't know, maybe build up their soil, their organic indexing of soil. I mean, they usually say minimum tillage to no tillage to do that, and they're just letting, you know, the wet, wet snow and the microbes do the work, but very interesting um, year after year. It's been like three years since I actually paid attention to what was going on on like my house. Hey, like, for agriculture. I think I think some of them are doing like a snow fence to help with roads and also like that extra snow uh, that they retain with a snow fence will actually uh, increase the soil moisture but I don't know how significant that actually is but and then there's um there's some fields that weren't even harvested. They're still standing corn. So I don't know how that whole thing works. If they come back in the spring and harvest it, I mean, I think you would be concerned with rotting or something like that. Or animals, you know, eat the rest of it. So there's a lot of different things than what I'm used to seeing back home that I saw. Our neighbors, they, they have, uh, it's like a 140 acre field across from our house. And it's right along the river and has like 40 acres of woods probably. And so we always take our dog for walks and stuff like that. And, uh, usually, usually you can see all the tillage and there's just nothing. It's like they just ran the combine and they basically said screw it with tillage. So. I don't really know what they plan on planting the next corner for beans, but right, so I'm worried about thirteen. Too far. Grab my truck. And then uh, another thing I observed was um, there's a lot, a lot, uh, 
a lot of the farms have, have changed. They uh, see a lot, a lot of uh, new buildings, a lot of new bins, um, uh, storage bins. Um, basically, they kind of open up a uh, two-acre little plot and put in a uh, grain complex. So I think what a lot of these farmers are doing here is they're getting a lot better yields than they have in the past, say like five five years ago. They're getting better yields. And so I think instead of buying a new tractor or whatever, they're investing in um, basically infrastructure and like 179, doing a 179 straight deduction on taxes. So. I know a lot of those new, uh, like, take John Deere for an example, a lot, of, a lot of the issues that could be fixed in the previous generations, you need now to have, like, a dedicated John Deere tech, technician come in um, to service your equipment, when, uh, whereas a farmer that was, you know, pretty adept and, in, uh, you know, pretty mechanically inclined could fix it themselves, now you kind of need... Uh, John Deere service type to come in to do the same thing, you know, but at the cost of like 120 bucks an hour. So a lot of these guys, I guess, um, are investing in um, things other than machinery uh, to write off their crops. Because I guess this year was really good um, back where I lived for corn, corn and soybeans. I guess it was like a, a record, record yield. So a lot of these guys have more money than they're used to having, and uh, they'd rather invest that than pay the taxes. So I don't really need to invest in a new, new, you know, three hundred dollar tractor when they have one that's five years old and it works just fine. So might as well just invest in storage and drying. Uh, So you can store more grain and hold out for better prices. I also was curious because um, about about um, purchasing agriculture land and then eventually, like, you know, leasing it and what's the cash value of lease? And, um, it's about like a, right around our house is like 190 an acre. Which I understand, like other places like Iowa and stuff, you know, they're around like 200, 200 plus, plus an acre, but, you know, their yields are obviously higher to reflect that. So, if you were to invest in, say, 100 acres and you pick up the 100 acres at uh, 4,000 an acre, or um, depending on where you are, it ranges from. You know, I was looking at land anywhere from, you know, shitty yielding land at 2,000 an acre. You're looking at maybe like 150 bushel corn. At 2,000 an acre, you go up to 250 bushel an acre corn, you know, over west of the cities. And it's, uh, you know, 10,000 10, an acre or over by Bloomer and Eau Claire. It's, you know, you got some good yielding, probably like 200 bushel corn. That's 4,000 an acre. So with cash value leases around. 200 stuff like that but um, if you were to like just buy the land with no intent of farming it would take you know 20 years to pay this off just off of, you know if you were to lease it but um, that's another thing is uh, kind of I, I was curious so I emailed um, I think it was I forget who it was, but it was a loan, loan, uh, agriculture loan person for the Department of Agriculture in Wisconsin. And I was just curious because I never see any kind of egg, like egg land being bought and sold. Um, and she says there's, there, there, there isn't that, I mean, there's quite a bit of turnover, but a lot of it's within like the family, but. There is a good fair amount of buying and selling between 
two parties that really have no relation or much communication, so which I thought was interesting. But uh, you just you just don't see many people acquiring the land. It's mostly they're acquiring tillable land through renting, which is uh, when you run the numbers, it's pretty hard to turn a decent profit. Let's say you get nine hundred dollars worth of corn or whatever out of the field but you put in 700 500 or 700 of nutrients and fungicides and herbicides and seeds then you gotta factor on your, your cash value so say say it costs you 700 to actually put that crop in the ground and take it out and you only get you know, 900 to 1000 so you're looking at two three hundred Two three hundred dollars an acre profit, which is still pretty, pretty good. But I mean, in the grand scheme of things, you need to farm a tremendous amount of acres to actually like come out with a decent, decent net. I mean, you could have, a, you could have a large gross, but I mean, obviously your expenses, your capital investments, also tremendous as well. It's actually interesting when you actually itemize everything per acre it's <laughs> you don't really it's all about I mean if your bushel drops 10 20 bushel an acre you're basically screwed so you do all this work and you're not really getting paid for it at the end of the day so. so after doing a little bit of research over the you know years, I have tremendous respect for um, crop farmers. I imagine most crop farmers have some other form of income as well. Uh, maybe they're doing like beef or they're doing trucking or stuff like that. Because if you're just doing crop farming alone, uh, you pretty much have to be running you know, a couple thousand acres to make to make it worth your you know, the guys that do a couple hundred, I, mean, I don't even know how they can be making any money. At the end of the day, your net worth isn't being invested in it. I mean, you're worth, you're worth quite a bit of money if you actually own the land. But I mean, your equipment, you buy equipment, you buy it new, it depreciates so fast, and it's a great thing to go, uh, you know, if it's going against your net income, but it's the only a good thing if you have, if you're a profitable operation, if you're just barely profitable, I mean, writing off stuff against your net income, it doesn't make any sense, because you don't have any, like, disposable income anyways to offset with write-offs, so. Back home, all the egg land that's being sold, it's like, say it's like 100 acres for sale, but 40 of it's tillable and 60 of it's woods. But it's still, it's still being sold at 3,000 an acre, you know. So it's like such a ripoff right now to buy egg land that it's probably why it's still for sale because no one's buying it. But I mean, another thing is, uh, when I was talking to that lady, there's so many loans available, like direct operating loans at like 1.5% interest. <laughs> it's incredible. I mean, I look at my dental school, it's at 6%. So I mean, I could get a mortgage at 3% on a house. So. Very, very cheap to borrow money if you're a farmer. So might as well borrow as much money as you can because it's literally, it's, it's essentially free at that rate up to a million dollars in direct operating so
I know there's a guy that lives up uh, up the road from my parents. He, I think he farms around 700 acres himself. It's just him, I think. And uh, he's just like a hobby farmer, essentially. He, worked at, he was working at uh, Anderson Windows and then uh, doing crop farming and stuff in the evenings. I'd like to own like 400 acres, rent it out, and then build my house in the far back corner so no one can see it. That's my dream. <laughs> Maybe like on a hill overlooking like a pond or something. That would be ideal. And if it's if it's uh, zoned as agriculture and I'm leasing it, like pay literally nothing in taxes on that land, so it doesn't cost me much to own it. I think that same field I was talking about earlier is 140, 120 acres, and I was looking at uh, taxes, and I think they pay four, $400 in taxes on that 120 acre field. Whereas, like, my parents' lake homes, I think they pay, it's like, two acres on the lake, it's like $7,500 a year in property taxes. So. This kind of shows you the discrepancy, but, uh, you know, I think everyone would, uh, you know, I think when these commodity prices are, say, like $4 a bushel of corn, you know, even if you're, you're, you own your land and you're doing amazing yields, you're still not even making that much money, so. I imagine anything under a four dollar bushel of corn, you might as well not even farm. You can't even make make money at that. So. I'm also curious what the mark if you go to let's say you go buy build a uh, tractor and you get it built at like Waterloo or something like that or if you buy a piece of machinery say like you buy another 8360R from a John Deere dealer I was curious what what the actual profit from the dealer is on that that piece of machinery because I mean I mean Let's say you buy it for, I don't know what it's doing those for, say like 340000 maybe, brand brand new out of the box, never been used. I mean, where where is that money? Like, is it in material? Where, where <laughs> like, I don't understand. I mean, there's not $300,000 worth of steel on that thing or plastic. Or, uh, I imagine they maybe have like. 70,000 max of material onto that piece of equipment. I just don't, I just don't understand where all the money goes into that piece of equipment. I mean, you can get a 45,000 pound excavator for Two hundred thousand. So I, don't, I just don't see where the money is being invested. I like how they come up with that price, or maybe they're just charging that price because they can and farmers will buy it. Because let's say they have a good year, they're gonna write off those payments. You know, say five, seven years against their incomes. So, Maybe a farmer is willing to pay that much so they get a new tractor and then they pay no taxes, but I have a feeling that that's probably why the prices aren't the way they are. Oh shit. 
pushing you. So, uh, you're gonna run out of fertilizer. I guess that means we should probably come up today too. Okay, so we're calling it a day. Oh, there's a train. Anyways, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening to me talk to myself, basically. And uh, until next time.